I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, Mike Mignola, to the show to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Atlantis. Welcome, Mike. It's so great to finally talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here. You you have... Oh, my gosh. Okay, I, I can't even... We can't even really scratch the surface of everything you've done. I do want to make it a little bit more Atlantis focused, but I want to get something sure. out of the way off my chest. It sounds like I'm going to be the first one ever to say to you or anybody who has ever said to you, um, and I know a million fans are going to gasp, that I was introduced to your work through Atlantis before ever knowing what Hellboy was. So I apologize. I apologize. No, that's great. <laughs> that's great. But it's good because, I'm, you know, like, again, I'm from a different group and generation, you know, that we're in our 20s and 30s now. And we were like our kids when we were younger. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate all of your work. So this is great. You know, this is great to talk to you. Well, I'm happy <laughs> to do it. I'm happy to tell you anything I remember since it's, it, I, I didn't actually realize it was 20 year anniversary. So I'm like, well, that explains why so much of it is a blur. <laughs> Does it really feel like it's 20 years for you? Do you remember do you remember the first day coming into the Disney Studios to discuss a little bit more about what, you know, Don Hahn apparently had called you and said, "Hey, do you want to, you know, be a part yeah, I, of this I, project?" Or? I distinctly I distinctly remember uh I I don't remember where I was, but I remember coming home from wherever I was, there being a message on my answering machine from Don saying this is Don Hahn at Disney and, you know, we're doing a film and we're doing the film. We're trying to do the film in your style. Uh, would you like to work on it? And, you know, go, I guess I have to return that phone call because that's the strangest phone message I've ever gotten. Um, you know, because it never, I mean, you know, comics is its own world. It never, never occurred to me that anyone at Disney Studios would know who I was. So, yeah, I called him back, and uh, I agreed to his first offer, which I probably, you know, this way you, you don't have an agent or anybody. So, you know, they offered me money to work on this thing, and uh, I mean, I would have worked on it. I won't say I would work on it for free, but it was just one of those, you're going to pay me by the hour to come to Disney and sit in meetings on a film that you want to look like my stuff it was just it was so surreal and then i do remember the first day you know they flew me up there and i remember walking down the hallway um and they were working on tarzan so there was all this just amazing pre-production art for tarzan all over the place i mean got the, the guys that worked on that stuff i mean these guys could draw like nobody's business it's just all these beautiful drawings pencil drawings everywhere and in the middle of all this stuff i i get to a Point, and they've got enlargements of some of my comic book pages with overlays over them, diagrams explaining what I do and about shapes and all the stuff that I didn't even understand. I mean, I, I don't know how I do what I do or I don't even know what I do, but clearly people were analyzing what I was doing and breaking it down in such a way that they could tell the other animators, do this, don't do this. So that was, I mean, it's, 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 it's like, I, I think of it as like number two, you know, it's one of the two most surreal places I've ever been, Mo you know, most surreal experiences I've ever had. So yeah, I remember that. And then, then it becomes kind of a blur. So, so they officially credit you as production designer. So can you, can you go into a little bit more detail about what exactly you would do when you would go into the studio? Um, it seems like mostly I just talked. Um, I mean, when I went in, you know, they had designed the characters, and I kind of, um, I, I, I went in and did a pass, and you can see it on the, the DVD extras. You can see I went in, and I didn't design the characters, but I kind of Mignola-ized the characters. I probably made a couple little costume changes, uh, which I don't know if they used them or didn't use them. It seems, I, I, of all the character costumes it seems like the girl um her costume might be something i came up with or I, I partly came up with i know i did a lot of drawings of her um you know early on again it was just i the film was so 
fluid at that point, that the, the story wasn't really fleshed out. I mean, they had, I guess they had a plot or something kind of like a script, but it was, you know, very different than what it is now. Um, so I was, I was kind of all over the boat. I just, I just kind of sat around and said, oh, what if, what if we did this or what if we did that? And, and what was strange is they actually listened to me. Yeah, and, and then, you know, at one point they did ask, you know, what do you want to focus on? And I did say, well, let me do the city. So um, I, didn't do a, I didn't do a million drawings. I didn't work on this thing for gigantic stretches of time. I would really work on it for three or four days at a time. I would go up and maybe spend a day or two at the offices, and then I would go home and work, uh, and I'd work for three or four days on stuff, and then I'd kind of roll back into you know, doing my regular comic stuff. Um, I remember you know, working on the city. You know, my, my thinking as a comics guy is to design stuff really fast. So I remember coming home from Disney and the next day going, okay, I said I would work on the city. Um, and, and, you know, taking a shower that morning where I do all my thinking and going, okay, Atlantis, what's it going to look like? We've been talking about Angkor Wat and these kind of ruins. So ding, 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 ding. I kind of put the shapes together in my head. I sat down and banged out you know, 10 or 20 drawings. I think I probably faxed them to Disney. Uh, and it was kind of like, well, from, from what I just did, you can build the city. You know, I didn't do paintings. I didn't do gigantic, elaborate, finished drawings. I just, you know, did a bunch of shapes. Um, and it, I remember being in a meeting and someone, someone brought in this beautiful painting, huge painting, beautiful painting. And it was it, basically a diagram for how the plumbing in Atlantis would work for a film that was never going to feature plumbing. And I thought, well, there's the difference. You know, <laughs> I, I, I could be spending months, you know, and getting a decent paycheck working on giant elaborate drawings of this, of this thing. But my, my whole thing was, I'm just there to solve some problems. So I, I would, you know, just bang out these drawings really fast um, I'm trying to think of any like ideas I came up with. Uh, we have this, you know, this idea of, of these the green belt kind of growing around Atlantis, and Atlantis would be this beautiful thing with all these like big plant things growing around. Um, I don't. I'd like to think that that was my idea. I don't remember, um, but I do remember coming up with this idea that these plants would hang down. These kind of gourd things would hang down, and they would be kind of hollowed out and carved into their their kind of treehouse things. So I remember. I think that was my idea, and I think that's in the film that I was excited about. Um, I don't know if it was my idea that that you know when we build to the climax of the film we reveal that the Atlantis we're, we've been seeing uh, is just the tip of the city and that the waters recede or the city rises up and we see how phenomenal the giant city is. Um, and, and then the, the flying fish armada I did come up with, which is funny because, again, I thought I was kind of scamming this production because I would just sit there in meetings and I would just mostly talk and they're paying me by the hour, which – I've never had a real job where you get paid by the hour. So that was, you know, I thought I was scamming everybody. And then one day we're walking down the hallway and I was looking at this Anchor Watt photo reference and these statues with tree roots growing all over them. And I said, yeah, we're going to have our guys walking around over these things that we assume are just statues. But what if when we get to the climax of the film, it turns out these are actually vehicles. So in as long as it took to say that, I made up, you know, or I, I, I started to make up what turned out to be the climax of the movie. So they, you know, that was one of those days where I went, oh, they got their money's worth out of me that day. Um, so that was, I mean, it was just, it was just so weird to come up with ideas off the cuff and they actually get turned into a movie. I mean, and Kirk and Gary are like, are, are the, 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 the ultimate odd couple, you know, cause, cause, you know, um, the one is like the big burly kind of Viking guy whose entire office was full of like Todd McFarlane spawn figures. And uh, that's Gary. And, and Kirk is, you know, had this pristine office with, you know, these little, you know, Disney figures on his desk. And if you moved one, he moved it back to where, 
you know, where it was supposed to be. Um, but between the two of them, they, they were so excited about the fact that they wanted to do a, an old school Disney adventure movie. And I remember the T-shirts we had said, you know, less singing, more explosions. Um, and yeah, I think it, when I was first up there, there was there was kind of like an animal sidekick for Milo, but they said, no, no, we're going to cut that because we want to really get back to this kind of, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, you know, adventure film. And I do remember whoever was head of animation, uh, he came in one day and he was looking at the production art and he went and he kind of, he was really quiet and he went, uh, why why are why do they all have guns and that's when i went uh oh <laughs> uh oh <laughs> because this thing was really i mean it was there was a lot of real rough stuff in the in the early ideas i mean one guy i always assumed he was down in the basement somewhere when he would come up for a meeting all he was doing was designing death traps you know they step on this and spikes jump out and you know it's just like wow how many <laughs> How many guys are going to be, you know, killed off in this film? Um, there were a lot more guns. There were a lot more death traps. All things considered, there there's a lot of heavy material and emotional, you know, backdrop to this film. So when you got to see the final product, did you go on the the blue carpet, <laughs> as they called it when when it first came out to to see the film? I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was. I think that was probably my first. That was my first movie premiere. Uh, wow. Yeah, that was that was that was great. That was that was again just surreal. Um, what yeah. was it like to to see the film with an audience? I don't you know I don't remember. I remember the after party, um, and but I don't remember. Yeah, you know, the the weird thing with with uh, with that kind of stuff is by the time. The movie is done. By the time there's a premiere, you've seen bits and pieces of the movie so many times. I know, with, like with Hellboy, I'd seen the finished film probably a couple times before a premiere. So you're kind of used to seeing it, and I don't, I, I just, I don't remember the the audience experience at all. Um, no, it's just, it's one of those. I remember, I, I think I didn't walk down the carpet because I just thought, well, I don't do that. So I kind of walked around it, you know, I, I just, yeah, it, it, and, and then seeing the movie, I don't remember, but I do remember the party after. Did you run into anybody like Michael J. Fox at some point? <laughs> no, you know, I, I heard he was around. I don't, I don't think I even saw him. Um, I remember, I don't, I don't think I remember talking to anybody the only guy i actually did really meet um and god I, I i can't remember his name the guy who played sweet oh phil morris yeah who's the nicest guy on earth he came up to me at the san diego convention and apparently he lives not far from me uh so we had talked about getting together and stuff like that so yeah that that was great he 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 kind of sought me out um that's but, great um, but that's the only person i think i ever really spoke to as far as you know the the actors i i didn't have direct contact with the animators for the most part um because like i i wouldn't know how to instruct anybody and in how to draw like me so they actually had um there was probably more than one person, but I know uh, Ricardo Delgado, who I knew from the world of comics. Ricardo said part of his job, because he was on staff at the time, part of his job was to teach people to draw like me. Because I just draw like I draw. You know, there's no mm -hmm. part of me that says, oh, this is what I do and I can tell you how to do it. It's like, no, when I draw, it, it, it comes out looking like this. Um, I will say they, they did an amazing job faking my, my style and even my design sense because there's stuff in the film that I look at and I go, wow, I don't remember designing that. And then going, <laughs> oh, yeah, because I didn't. But it, somebody really understood my, my shapes and my attitude and stuff. I mean, I remember those, those stone giants at the end of the film. I love those things. They look like something I would design. But I didn't. I guess, well, Disney had never done anything like this in a in a sense of the design is based off of something that maybe you would see in a comic book. And I think that 
that's another reason that 20 years later, not only the story and the characters, but the beautiful production scale of this is just so mind blowing when you think about it, because we we talk about this in several of their interviews that, again, this is not a musical film. It's an adventure film. And you really would never get anything like that from Disney before. So the fact that it that we we're still talking about it 20 years later really shows to the attest of time that the animation is 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 so beautifully done and it it's it would never be outdated in the way that it's portrayed and 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 based off of your beautiful work that you've done in the past and and from some of the conversations I've seen online you know aside from the documentary there were a couple other animators that were just so thrilled that they could work on something even if it was like indirectly with you and that they would be able to use this type of style because they always were fascinated with it originally when they saw your work and I just thought that was so cool like how could you like how could you imagine all the stars were would align to do something like this <laughs> yeah it's, I, I, I you know again it at the time, it was just a weird novelty, you know. It was just like, oh, well, this is so crazy. Sure, I'll I'll, I'll work on this. Um, it's just, you, you know. And I remember, you know, Kirk and Gary were hoping to do more stuff like this. And I think we, I think we had vague, maybe at the premiere and stuff, had vague conversations about other films that would be cool to do. Um, and it just, you know, this kind of stopped those kind of talks cold. Do you remember yeah. them talking to you about the attractions? They had like two themed attractions. They were thinking of doing a roller coaster ride in Walt Disney World. They were going to re um, revamp the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ride at Disneyland. Do you remember them saying anything to you like, hey, we actually would like some help with concept for this? No, no. I mean, it's, again, I'm, I'm not... I'm not the mechanical designer. You know, I think there were so many guys. I was just kind of like the inspiration guy. I wasn't mm-hmm. really the nuts and bolts design guy, uh, which is why I think I've always been a little uncomfortable with that production designer uh, title because I don't think I really did what a production designer does. Um, that's why, like, my credit on the Hellboy films, and I think on uh, – I also worked on Blade 2 with Del Toro. Uh, I think my credit is usually visual consultant. It kind of is very nonspecific. It's like, yeah, he kind of comments on stuff and does some drawings, but he's not really this and he's not really that. Um, so, yeah, for as a production designer, eh, I certainly didn't really do do what a real production designer would do, I don't think. Um, I was just a guy in there shooting off ideas and, um, yeah, I, 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 more inspiration, I think, than, than actual, you know, work. And, and Gary and Kirk were describing that when they would talk to the cast about what type of film this was, they said, hey, we're in Disneyland, but we're not going to Fantasyland. We're going off to Adventureland. Adventureland, yeah. Yeah, right? So if there were ever a future project that might come your way from Disney or elsewhere where there would be another another project saying, hey, you're going down to Disneyland, you're not going to Adventureland, you're not going to Fantasyland, which of the lands would you like to go to, like Frontierland or Tomorrowland? What would what would be something that you would like to try for the first time? Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that some kind of science fiction thing, a future land thing. I mean, it, I, it's funny. I, I've never really been tapped again to do this kind of work. Um, Which is crazy, by the way. So if anybody's listening and has a big production company, yeah, give them like I a mean, call. It would be, it would be, it would be <laughs> nice. It's, it's exciting to be in at the very beginning on something when it's like we don't we kind of want to make this movie but we're not really sure what it is that's that's a really exciting time to be involved with with something um and and i was pretty much there on atlantis i mean they were working obviously for a while when i got there but i remember i remember the first the first I'm sure it was the first time I was in the office. They uh, they had a meeting where all the all the different you know designers 
uh, it was so much like an art school uh, critique, right? Everybody brought in their work and pinned it up all over the walls. And Don walked around and said, this is great. This is great. This is great. All this stuff's great. There was, somebody was designing mushroom people. You know, they were like, oh, mushroom people. That's great. Everything was great. And I remember thinking, when do you start saying yes, no, yes, no, more of this, change this, change that? Because again, my, my, my thinking as a comics guy is to solve problems really fast. You know, nail down the script, figure out what you need, design that stuff, make the movie. Um, and I remember, and it was, I think, of, uh, you know, middle of the week or something, um, or maybe it was a Monday. I don't know what it was. But Don, at the end of the thing, Don said, uh, this is great. We'll meet again in a week. And I went, that guy over there was designing mushroom people. There aren't going to be mushroom people. And he said, no, there will never be mushroom people. And I said, you just sent this guy back to his cubicle to work for another week on mushroom people, <laughs> you know, I was like, I couldn't imagine the size of the operation and the amount of time that was being devoted to everybody just exploring every crazy idea. And that's what it seemed to go on for months that it was just everything is possible. And my whole thing was, you know, it, it, and I think there, the, it was explained to me that this is kind of the Disney way, that you kind of invent these characters and these characters kind of lead the way as far as how things are going to go. And I thought, hmm, what if we nail down the story and then just make the character do what we want, <laughs> want him to do? I, I had much more of a like, like, like. Let's let's solve this problem. Let's let's get in today, solve this problem, and 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 get on to the final design stuff. Um, so I mean, it was it was exciting. It was fun to be around this this kind of energy where everything was possible. But it was so not the way my brain, you know, worked. There's so many different remakes now. What would your thoughts be if Disney kind of approached you to remake one of their earlier classics, either live action or animated, and revamp it, change it, change its story plot, change its design? Is there any Disney film that you are that you just adore? You would love to give a shot at? What What pops into my mind right off is uh, Sword in the Stone. You know, the, to do a live action version of that. Uh, or a, a tougher, darker version of that, because there's there's a lot of really dramatic stuff in there. Um, or bed knobs and broomsticks. Yeah, I, I always thought it would be it would be exciting, and you know I've never gotten a phone call where somebody said we want to remake this, and we want it to be you know darker, uh, more dramatic, blah blah whatever it is. Uh, and I, and I think I would actually be pretty good at that as far as a rethinking stuff. Because the beauty is you want to keep what works. You want to mm -hmm. keep the magic of that stuff. Uh, I see way too many remakes where they just said, oh, we obviously don't care about the original film or the original source material. So we're, you know, the whole idea is going to be to, to change it. It's like, yeah, you can change it, but just amplify certain things. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with that totally. Don't, don't I feel like that's what's missing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't make it different just to make it different. Um, for a while there, there were a bunch of us talking, um, about, you know, uh, cause you know, Universal has been trying to relaunch their, their, uh, monster universe. Oh my gosh. Uh, Frankenstein, yes. Dracula, all that stuff. Uh, and I thought nobody ever came to me about this, but I thought, you know, if I were going to do it, I mean, they always go, oh, we want to create a shared universe. Well, you had one. You had a shared – you, you created a shared universe with Frankenstein and the Wolfman and all those, all those characters. Instead of throwing that out or starting completely from scratch, go back to what worked. And I, you know, a friend and I were working a little bit on the idea of, of, of Dracula because that's one of my favorite – things and yeah. i said you could actually do an almost straight remake of that film modernizing it uh because of oh, course you yeah. want to, to modernize it but having a guy go to and the, the best part of dracula is always the trip to the castle mm -hmm. i said 
keep what's in the film, except that, you know, you, you replace coaches with cars and, and stuff like that. But the idea that your cell phones don't work in Transylvania, you know, you could do, do, to keep the beats, to keep the, the eeriness, the spookiness and, and do a more classic remake. Um, you know, and I think you could do that with almost any of those films, even the terrible ones, even like the House of Dracula, House of Frankenstein. You know, there's there's a magic to how funky those films are. And I think maybe it's just me seeing the challenge saying, well, it's a bad film. It's really silly. But what if you took all that really silly stuff and just made it scary? Uh, and I've done it in Hellboy. I've done, I've done some kind of monster mashup kind of stories that, that were just, they were amazingly silly, stupid ideas I came up with. And the trick for me with my stuff is to always come up with something that starts out stupid, come up with the stupidest idea and then treat it like it's Shakespeare. You know, if you can just keep the magic of the, the original silly, stupid idea and then just take it seriously. There's always these rumors that Atlantis will get its own live action treatment. And I think, you know, Disney's been doing a lot more of those recently. So if that were the case, and there was a chance to even go into more detail about the film, would you love to be on, you know, involved in the, a project of just, you know, revamping it or, or remaking it? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be it would, it would be so much fun to get some of the gang back together, you know, and 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 at least consult or or, or something like that. Um, again, I, you know, my my, I would love to see the uh, a live action Atlantis film. I think that would be fantastic. I think all the pieces are certainly in there for a great live action film. Um, Unfortunately, I can't see it happening because I think when people look at doing stuff like that, they look at how the film was originally received, and they don't look at the fact that, you know, it, the world's different now. Look at the fan response now. I think they would just I, – I, I'm, I'm afraid that Atlantis is always going to be on that that pile of the ones that didn't work. And And the fact that – you know, it's again, it's been 20 years, but I'm just so lucky that I get to speak to you and to so many people part of the creative team because this is such, this film has been such a, a part of my life, my childhood, and I, I adore it so much. It's one of my favorite Disney films of all time. And there are so many other people, as you know, um, who love this film too. So do you have anything you'd like to say to them uh, about, you know, celebrating the film itself? I'm so happy looking back now and saying, oh, I got to be part of something like this. Milo's fingers are square because they're my, it's the way I draw hands. I, re I remember watching a screening and saying to the guy next to me, what's the deal with his hands? And I go, oh, those are your fingers. I made an impact on this thing. Uh, the fact that I made up things off the cuff, uh, off the cuff, the, the fish armada thing that ended up getting turned into a film. Um, it's overwhelming when you look back and you go, oh, there are a gazillion people who love this thing that you had something to do with. So um, I'm just gigantically grateful that I had that experience and that, you know, people are, are you know, People love this thing to be, you know, to, to make an impact, you know, to, on something on that level where people grew up and, 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 and for whatever reason, love that thing. And you had something to do with it. Um, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's, you know, that, and I've done it, I guess there's a couple things I've worked on where people that have made kind of an impression on people. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to wrap your brain around because you just draw and you just do what you do. And it's always a little overwhelming when you find out that it actually had a real impact on people. So I'm just amazingly grateful and, and thrilled that this film has found, you know, that, that the audience that reacted to this film is now grown up and talking about it. So I says to him, what's wrong with my meatloaf? And he says to me, oh. 
Hold on a second, Marjorie. I got another call.